Hi, my name is Joseph Lee. I'm the medical director for Hazelden Betty Ford's Youth Continuum. I'm a child psychiatrist and an addiction specialist. Today I want to have an intimate conversation with you about your loved one and their care. When you get treatment for your loved one for a substance use disorder, you want to make sure that they're not just ceasing drug use or reducing drug use. You want to really understand that the people that are taking care of your loved one understand their development, their risks, their trajectory, and their strengths. And that's what this conversation is about. One of the unfortunate things when we're talking about substance use disorders is that people get overly focused on substances and drugs and not on the kids, not on the individuals, not on the young adults and how they develop and what their trajectory is. When you think about chronic disease models like heart disease or diabetes, there are risk factors that pop up long before symptoms of the disease pop up sometimes year or decades before. In fact, the same goes for substance use disorders. Did you know that you can identify risk factors for substance use disorders in children long before they actually start picking up any drug use? Starting in grade school at the ages of 10 or 11, high-risk youth can be identified. There's a lot of scientific literature that can identify high-risk youth who might develop substance use disorders down the line. Some of these studies compare twins as they grow up. Some of them consider the children of people with addiction compared to people who don't have addiction, and you follow them over decades. One of these areas of research in identifying high-risk youth has to do with a concept called delayed discounting. Delayed discounting is basically the idea that the longer you create a delay in the time that a person receives a reward, the more likely they're going to discount it. So here's how the experiment works. You might offer a young person the option between $10 today and $20 today. And of course, at time zero, everyone's going to pick $20. But let's say you gave them the option of having $10 today, or tomorrow they could have $20. Or maybe you make them wait two days for $20, or three days or four days. Well, naturally, all of us, because we need to eat now and not tomorrow, are at one point or another going to choose $10 today and not $20, say, four days from now or five days from now or 14 days from now. While all of us do that, some kids do that faster than others. What that means is that they can't wait for the reward as long as other people. They're more wired for instant gratification. consider the converse of the reward situation, it explains a lot of why young people who struggle with substance use get into repeated trouble. So instead of the value of rewards, consider the value of consequences. Let's say, for example, that as a function of time, at time zero, a young person makes a mistake, and they're good kids, and they feel bad about it, and they apologize to the people around them, and they tell themselves, never again, I've learned my lesson, I've crossed the line, I'm going to change my behavior, next semester is going to be better, this class is going to be better, I'm never going to do that again. And we've had those honest conversations with our kids before. But what happens as a function of time is not the erosion of memory. These memories stay alive in our young people. But what happens is the value of that experience does diminish as time goes on. Young people at time zero might never want to make that mistake again. But as time goes on, a few days later, they might say, well, you know, there were some circumstances in that situation that were fairly unique. And they start to rationalize. And a few days later, you see a further erosion. And then they protest and rebel, and they repeat similar behaviors. And then once they have consequences again, they have another honest conversation with you saying, I'm never going to do that again. I've really learned my lesson now. But as a function of time, they'll depreciate the value of those consequences and they'll make that mistake again. So we know that young people who are vulnerable for addiction tend to extinguish rewards quickly as a function of time compared to other people. They can't wait for reward as long. But that's actually not where they get in all their trouble. Sometimes they get into trouble because they have a hard time hardwiring consequences. To illustrate this example, I want to use a metaphor. Let's say that you're driving on a rainy road and it's very slippery and you almost get into an accident. You pull off on the side of the road, and you're scared. You cinch up your seatbelt, you move your seat up, you check all your mirrors, you're going to drive very carefully, but not forever. As a function of time, you're going to go back to how you used to drive slowly. Well, young people with substance use disorders who are at risk tend to do that very fast. It's not that they forget what happened, their memory is maintained, but the value, the sting of the experiences that are hurtful to them, it erodes over time faster than other people. 
they have good morals, they have good principles, they love their family, they know the difference between right and wrong, but when they make a mistake, those consequences don't stay in their hearts for very long. It stays in their heads, they might get depressed, they might have low self-image as failures and rejections and hard times accumulate, but they have a hard time hardwiring, internalizing those consequences and learning from those mistakes. Before we go on, I want to explain a bit about the science of addiction from a classical conditioning perspective. Now, the science of addiction is rather complicated, so I'm simplifying a few concepts here, but I think you'll get the idea. A famous experiment in classical conditioning is called Pavlov's dog, and we've all heard about this. This is an experiment where you give the dog some food, but before you give the dog some food, you might ring a bell. Over time, the dog associates the bell and the food together, so every time the dog hears the bell, the dog starts to salivate because it's anticipating the reward, which is food. In many ways, this is how addiction unfolds for young people. They may use e-cigarettes or marijuana or alcohol, and they associate it with certain cues during the day. And now they've linked a reward with a certain time, a certain feeling, a certain memory, a certain setting, and these become intertwined. All of a sudden, using becomes a predominant reward in their lives. Using then becomes like a $50 an hour job, and the rest of their life in comparison is like a $10 an hour job. And of course they're going to choose using initially. But here's the trick. Over time they become tolerant. That $50 an hour job, that very first high, the first buzz that they got, starts to diminish. And it then becomes a $40 an hour job, a $30 an hour job, they gotta work two shifts for 20 bucks, and then if they stop using, they start to suffer. They become dysphoric and sad, something feels wrong, and now they have to re-up and go back to using and they're stuck on a cycle. And all that takes more and more time. They have to hustle for better prices for drugs. They have to make different kinds of friends and stronger connections. More of their life slowly starts to revolve around obtaining substances. And as a consequence, the time they have for life, the things that they used to like to do, self-care, exercise, relationships, academics, these areas start to suffer. And that's where the lying, the stealing, the broken promises occur. That's when the consequences occur and the gap between who they are and their using continues to widen until it finally snaps. And that's when most people choose to get help. Next, I wanna to talk to you about how young people who are vulnerable for addiction might make decisions slightly differently than some of their other peers. One of the ways that we make decisions is by weighing outcomes and consequences. We think about pros and cons. In this philosophy, what dominates is just getting from A to B. Doesn't matter exactly how you get there. So this is like having a statement like, ends justify the means, or no harm, no foul, or if it ends well, all is well. You might have a young person, for example, who's vulnerable for addiction, and they might cram for a test, but as long as they got an A, they don't worry about it too much. Now, all of us think this way to some degree. It so happens that young people who are vulnerable for addiction are slightly different than some of their peers. And there are some psychological tells that you can identify early on. Risk taking isn't just impulsivity. To demonstrate the crossover and differences between impulsivity from a condition like ADHD and risk taking, consider this metaphor. Let's say that a young person decides to sneak away from home to buy an e-cigarette or a vape pen. Now, they might initially be very impulsive. In the heat of the moment, they're upset at somebody, they have some money in their pocket, they're gonna run out the door because they see an opportunity. But after that, they have to come up with a plan for how they're gonna hide that vape pen, how much they're gonna spend on it, how they'll use, how they'll socialize this with some of their friends. That's not ADHD impulsivity, that's what we call risk taking. Risk taking broadly means this, young people who are prone to addiction have a harder time hardwiring and internalizing consequences even when they occur. They tend to be more attracted by rewards than consequences when making decisions. Conversely, even when a consequence happens, they have a hard time hanging on to it compared to some of their peers. There's another way of decision making though that all of us have. And in this decision making style, we tend to weigh a person's intent and a person's values more than the outcome. For example, if you buy someone that you care about a Valentine's gift, but you bought it last minute, that person might be upset. Now, technically, you did buy flowers or a Valentine's gift, but you didn't put thought into it. And that person might say that your intent really wasn't genuine. And we have a competition all the time in our minds about whether to weigh values and intent or outcomes when we make a decision. Do we do it for the right reasons, or do we just want to get from A to B? And it so happens that young people, because of the way they're wired for reward, 
tend to be more wired for outcomes. Now, this idea is important because many parents who send their loved ones for any kind of treatment, they've had concerns about their child long before substance use began. They've always wondered why their child was a little different, why they made decisions that way, why their guilt was a little bit different than some of their siblings. And I'm trying to address some of those concerns in a non-moralistic, scientific way. Some of these children who may develop substance use disorders, they might be a little more prone to telling white lies in school or cutting corners here and there or not feeling the same kind of remorse as other children. Believe me, they have the same morals. They have the same heart. They love family members. But they're a little more smitten with reward. And as long as things end well, they t it tends to not bother them quite as much. The next concept I want to talk about is avoidance. We've already established that young people who are vulnerable for addiction they tend to be a little more short-sighted. The sure thing, the concrete rewards that are just under their control. And sometimes in life, this is not very compatible with the goals that they have. They might want to go to college or have to persevere through difficult times where outcomes are uncertain. And some young people who are vulnerable for addiction struggle with this even before they start using substances. For example, you might have a young person who's very talented, they're very gifted at school, but they might question every class they take. I'm never going to use this in the future. I don't see the point. And they start to struggle as they graduate from high school and move on to college, where their degrees and their process is a little more nebulous, and the goals are a little more uncertain. They need more concrete reward. You might also have talented individuals in music and art and sports. And when they're young, they really shine, because they're more talented than some of their peers. But as they get older, they start to find out that they have to put in a lot more work for just a little bit of a competitive edge, and they start to falter right around high school. The other aspect of avoidance has to do with how people deal with stress. And young people who are prone to addiction are short-sighted when it comes to that as well. For example, if they're rejected or they have a failure, they might become short-sighted and feel that the world is all over and that things will never get better. They tend to lose hope a little bit faster. They have a harder time sometimes bouncing back from romantic relationships that end or aspirations that were short-lived. If you look at the consumption curve for alcohol in the country, what you see is something that's very far from a bell curve. In fact, 30% of Americans don't even drink any alcohol at all. Another 30% of Americans consume less than one alcoholic beverage a week. Then the graph goes up steeply and you see that 20% of Americans consume roughly 80% of the alcohol in the country, and 10% of Americans consume over half the alcohol and liquor in the entire country. And this carries beyond substances. People may develop a problem with alcohol, but they may also develop a problem with gambling or other behaviors that cause harm in their lives. The important take home from this graph is that the problem isn't just alcohol. The real issue is that we're different from each other. We're conditioned differently. Some of us are more powerfully conditioned by reward than other people. And there will be a significant minority of people in the population at all times who are more susceptible to addiction and substance use disorders. Another important concept is this. A person who eats at one fast food joint is more likely to eat at another fast food joint compared to a person who doesn't eat any fast food at all. And what you find in that 10 to 20 percent of the population is that these individuals are more likely to have more than one vice. And I don't mean that from a moral perspective. What I'm saying is that people who use nicotine products are more likely to drink and vice versa. And young people who smoke marijuana are more likely to dabble in pills and vice versa. They're basically the same population. It does not mean that they'll get addicted to every substance or every vice in society, but they're at higher risk. There's an important concept called the common liability theory. The common liability theory basically says that there are common risk factors that later on in life lead to multiple disease states or conditions. So for example, a young person who doesn't eat well down the road may be at risk for diabetes, but they may also be at risk for heart disease. Common risk factors predict for mental health and addiction issues as well. And that's why you see that most young people who have substance use disorders have mental health conditions and vice versa. The risk factors overlap. So here's what you need to know in a nutshell. Young people who are prone to addiction, they're all about outcomes and rewards. But when bad outcomes happen, they have a hard time hardwiring and learning from those mistakes. And so a lot of people who come to treatment who are young continue to make mistakes over and over again despite their morals, despite their love for their family, despite their principles, despite their ambitions for the future. So you might wonder, what can we do? 
when young people have a hard time learning from consequences, but they're all about making decisions based on outcomes, what do we do? How do we break the cycle? How do we help them achieve their dreams and their goals? How do we restore them to the young people that we know that they are? In our program, we tend to emphasize three different values. One is humility, the second is empathy, and the third is grace. We teach them skills on how to relate to other people, how to resolve conflicts, and how to make decisions differently. Humility is another important concept in recovery. Humility means not taking oneself so seriously. In this illustration, you see that this person is standing on firm ground. And if they are met with rejection, if they fail at something, if they take a blow on the chin, they're going to fall. But they're going to get right back up because they're already on the ground. Well, in our world, we teach people to celebrate themselves, to believe in a kind of self-confidence. So what happens is, over time, they start to stack chairs. Their Instagram page looks different. Their resume looks different. Their athletic prowess is different. And somehow now, way up high, they're very different than other people. This makes it very hard for them to empathize because they're not the same. They see differences instead of commonalities. But here's what really happens. The higher you go, the harder you fall. So a lot of young people who've built their lives up on their achievements, on their talents, on their differences compared to others, when they suffer failure and rejection, and if they happen to be vulnerable for addiction, they fall hard. And they fall through the ground, the flat ground that is their humility, and they go down to a place where they have self-loathing and self-hatred and poor self-esteem. And we know that with a simple law of physics, that the higher you go, the harder you fall. Empathic thinking or empathic perspective is a really important concept here. Empathy is a little different than compassion. It doesn't necessarily mean that someone has to be suffering. Empathy is basically the concept that you can walk in someone's shoes and imagine what it might be like to live in their life and look at life through their lens. We've established that young people who are prone to addiction make decisions based on outcomes. They care about other people, but in the moment, they're thinking about rewards. And then downstream, we know that they're not going to learn from consequences when they make those bad decisions. So in our program, we tend to teach a lot of empathic perspective and a lot of empathic thinking. For example, in our family program, we put young people with other people's parents so they can share experiences and walk in each other's shoes. We have group activities and individual activities so they can reflect on their experiences and see commonalities between them and millions of other people who have the same disorder. This is why we have groups. This is why we have community activities. So much of our effort is really enhancing empathic decision making so that when they reach that fork in the road, they're not just thinking, what am I going to get or am I going to get caught with this? They're thinking, what would I have other people do in this situation? And that kind of thinking lends itself to recovery. Another important concept in recovery is the concept of grace. And this is not to get religious about anything. Grace is simply getting an unmerited forgiveness. A lot of young people come to treatment because their family members love them, not because there's some sense of justice, but because they care about them regardless of what happened before. That love is really unconditional. And when young people embrace the sense of grace, it transforms them because they have gratitude. They know that what they've been given is something that hasn't always been deserved. And because of that gratefulness, they're able to extend that grace to others.